Hello there, Chris Scullion from Tyrol Hack here with another tape in my VHS preservation project. Uh, this tape is a Nintendo GameCube uh, promotional VHS that was uh, released around about the time, uh, just before or around about the time the system was coming out. Um, and it was given to customers of Game and Electronics Boutique in the UK. Um, back in kind of early 2000s, Electronics Boutique and Game were kind of tied together. Um, Electronics Boutique owned something like a quarter of game um, until they kind of eventually went their separate ways. That's why there are still electronics boutique stores in North America, uh, but there aren't really any more in the UK. Um, similarly, similar to the way that game ended up buying GameStation and um, closing it down. So yeah, this was a tape that was given to customers um, just to kind of show all the GameCube stuff that was coming out. It's not, uh, the quality isn't as high as some of the other tapes you may have seen. Um, in my collection, um, that's just that's just the way the tape was. To be honest, a lot of it consists of um, there's like kind of 14 or so games, uh, 14, 15 games where someone at game has just basically compiled combinations of footage of gameplay that they've captured themselves if they had access to like the Japanese versions or promotional trailers uh, like this one um, using a kind of fake version of. Faithless uh, classic dance song Insomnia. <laughs> it sounds quite like that. Um, but yeah, so the, the quality is going to vary quite wildly. You're going to see some captured footage which is pretty low quality and you're going to see some trailers that are quite low quality. Uh, but presumably that's just down to the source that they got and uh, the, the subsequent video that they made from it. I mean, stuff like this looks okay. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting one. A lot of people kind of got this tape, so um, I would imagine in the UK a lot of people will be familiar with a lot of the stuff that's on this um, for those who aren't this is basically how game which continues to be the biggest purely because it's the main uh, the only big uh, gaming store in the UK um, this is how it kind of promoted the GameCube to its customers um, so yeah let's get cracking Right, first up is Super Monkey Ball, the kind of, uh, which everyone believes is one of the kind of hidden gems at the start of the GameCube uh, launch and then didn't become so hidden <laughs> over the years because everyone kind of, everyone who bought it still fondly remembers it. Um, it's a, it, it took a while for me to get used to this one, um, even though it shouldn't do because it's a pretty basic thing. Once, the, once I realised, something in my head clicked that once I realised that you're not actually controlling the ball, you're controlling the stage. So when you move the analog stick, you, you, you natural kind of um, instinct makes you think that you're controlling the ball, but you're actually, when you move the analog stick, you're tilting the entire stage and the ball's just rolling along with it. Um, which is a bit weird. The kind of perfectionist and completionist in me uh, struggles to watch this footage because whoever's playing it isn't capturing all the bananas and that's just sacrilege. You need to get all the bananas. Um, but yeah, it's made up of a number of kind of stages like this. As you can see, they get progressively harder. The aims to get to the stage before the time, the goal before the time runs out. Bananas optional, but um, not if you're me. And yeah, you get some bonus stages where you collect loads of bananas. You'll see one of those in a bit. But then it was also famous for a lot of it. It came with loads of mini games, and some of them were fantastic, like Monkey Target and Monkey Golf, and there's like Monkey Racing and all that. Um, I believe there may have been a monkey tennis at one point, uh, Alan Partridge style, but um, not in this game. I don't think that may have come in a later one. You, there were more monkey ball games, monkey ball two. Um, there was a a Wii one, Banana Blitz, I believe it was called. It was a launch game on the Wii, um, and it had an absolute ton of mini games. Um, and they tried a kind of story mode version as well, which wasn't quite as popular. Yeah, as the bonus stage, where as you can see, just. Multiple bananas to collect, um, as you do. But yeah, it's, it's a cult favourite. Anyone who remembers Monkey Ball uh, loved it and still kind of talks about it fondly. I'm sure lots of people would love to see another Monkey Ball. Um, it's it's one of those games where you can become a kind of ninja at it if you, if especially especially in later difficulty, uh, later stages. Um, 
like in this one, if you wanted to be a show off, you could turn to the right really quickly and throw yourself down. Um, and with a combination of luck and skill, you could reach the bottom fairly quickly instead of going this normal path. Um, later levels had lots of stuff like that where you could do wild shortcuts by deliberately flinging yourself off barriers and bouncing high into the air and hopefully you'll land further down the, the, the course. There's, there's loads of kind of room for experimentation that makes you feel like a an absolute legend but um, really difficult stuff. But yeah, as it is, a lovely wee game. Now this is a game that um, if any game is going to get the non-commentary version of this banned from YouTube it's going to be Crazy Taxi because it's obviously full of licensed music from Offspring and uh, Bad Religion and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely love Crazy Taxi, it's one of the best games, um, one, of, one of the best kind of arcade games ever I think, um, although nobody ever chose Gus, I don't know why this guy's chosen Gus. Um, so yeah, the general aim, I'll try and keep talking so that I don't get a copyright strike on the commentary version as well. Um, the general aim is that you're a taxi driver um, and you have to collect customers um, and take them to their destination. And in the original version, uh, this one and the arcade ones, a lot of those destinations were licensed places, so like Pizza Hut and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Tower Records, uh, the original Levi's store, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in subsequent HD versions they were just replaced with the chicken shop and stuff like that because uh, obviously those contracts ran out and also really sadly the, the music was replaced in later versions uh, so all the Offspring music was gone and replaced with kind of more uh, less expensive <laughs> punk music and rock music which is a bit of a shame because that's kind of a lot of people associate Crazy Taxi with the Offspring and Bad Religion because that's just what um, cause especially because like the early ones had like four tracks that just looped, so you kind of ended up learning those songs inside out. Uh, but it's brilliant. It's a tricky one to play. No, it's not tricky. It's easy to learn, but um, it's one of those games that kind of we're bumping into other uh, traffic. Is just basically the, the what happens. Um, you, you, you can. It's pretty much impossible to do a clean run of this without stuff like this happening, absolutely slamming in everything. Um, but it's brilliant, you can become a master of it if you, if you kind of learn all the routes and learn which passengers to pick up in which order. I once, way back in the days when it was on the Dreamcast, played it so much that I was able to play it, the arcade version where the time always runs down for like an hour, an hour and a half. <laughs> I'm constantly like continuing to play it because I knew exactly which people to collect and mastered how to avoid as many cars as possible but that was a long time ago. <laughs> Um, that won't happen anymore these days. Um, you see, yeah, Crazy Taxi is brilliant. There, there was there was a sequel to Crazy Taxi two, and I believe a three as well. Um, but the original one was kind of still the best because um, although the later ones added like a jump move, which made things more interesting because it made dodging the traffic a bit easier and let you take more wild shortcuts. Um, the original one still had that kind of purity where there was only a couple of special moves you could learn, like a speed boost um, and a kind of drift move both of which were done by kind of switching the brakes from reverse to drive in different ways while accelerating so it was kind of experts could learn how to drive quickly and do speed boosts and stuff and that was quite cool um, but yeah I, I love Crazy Taxi, it's available in HD on current systems so it's worth a look uh, except the Switch obviously for now Right, FIFA time um, or specifically 2002 FIFA World Cup based on the World Cup in Japan and South Korea. Um, this was the only football game that launched with the GameCube. Uh, there was no, it's because this was in between FIFA 2002 and 2003. Um, so rather than bring out a later, um, like a late version of FIFA 2002, um, or wait until 2003 came out, um, EA ported, uh, did, basically made a GameCube port of the World Cup game which was doing the rounds. Um, this the, this GameCube version was developed by Tos, Tose, the, the, I can never pronounce that, I'm assuming it's Tose because they're Japanese. Um, they're a kind of bizarre company. EA, EA Canada did most of it but they were helped by Tose um, who have been making games since like the NES days but never credit themselves. The only time they've ever credited themselves was the Starfy games on the DS because they own half the uh, the IP for those 
um, everything else, the just kind of nameless heroes that, that make loads of games and never credit themselves in them. So th this company since the 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s has made well over a thousand games. Uh, but you'd be hard pushed to name a lot of them because even the ones that people list as being Tozy games, it's just based on kind of guesswork and research because there's no, they never actually come out and admit it. Um, so yeah, but this is I believe to be one of them. Uh, the GameCube version, at least, uh, they helped out. Um, unlike most other FIFA games, well, unlike all other FIFA games, this one's got an original soundtrack, like an orchestral soundtrack, done by the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra, because EA uh, Canada's based in Vancouver, that's where all the FIFA games are made. Um, because it's in Japan and South Korea, they thought it'd be more kind of grandiose to do this kind of orchestral soundtrack, which is what you've got here, um, instead of the usual kind of rock and pop music that plays supporting F uh, normal FIFA games. So yeah, so it gave it this more kind of uh, dramatic, uh, formal feel to 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 the game. Um, this is actually banned in Germany. Uh, you wouldn't imagine a, a football game getting banned, but FIFA. Uh, this 2002 World Cup was banned in Germany after Oliver Kahn, the German goalie, uh, sued uh, sued EA because his face was in the game, um, and EA thought they were protected because they'd kind of signed the f they'd got the FIFA Pro license, which is a license that covers all players basically in likenesses but apparently Oliver Kahn had his own special kind of um, likeness deal and because he was in the game he was like what's going on here um, and EA had to pay him money and weren't allowed to sell 2002 FIFA World Cup in Germany anymore <laughs> so there you go yeah. that'll be why if you're German um, and presumably you were able to buy it at launch but after that if you weren't able to find it in the shops that's why it was banned uh, so there you go It's still one of the best opening uh, screens for any system. Right, Dave Mirror, Freestyle BMX 2. Basically, after the success of the Tony Hawk series, there was kind of loads of spin offs, and uh, some of them were successful, uh, like the Dave Mirror ones, and some of them weren't as successful, like it was Kelly Slater's Surfing or something like that. Um, but yeah, so this is basically Tony Hawk, but on a bike. Uh, so it's the same kind of idea. A bit trickier than Tony Hawk because. Um, unlike in Tony Hawk games, you, you, if you land backwards like that, it can lead to kind of awkward controls. So in Tony Hawk, you could easily land f facing forwards or backwards, and still kind of you just adjust your footing uh, accordingly. Whereas here, it was really kind of advised to try and land facing forward, so it was an extra kind of wee trick, uh, an extra kind of bit of difficulty involved. Um, there was three Dave Mirror games, maybe a f I think there was actually a fourth later on as well, uh, but it all kind of went sour when um, Acclaim released BMX XXX, which was originally supposed to be Dave Mirror's BMX XXX, and by all accounts he was up for it originally, thought it was a great joke, um, until his lawyers found out and said, no, you really need to uh, not be involved in this because it's going to damage your reputation, and he ended up suing a claim when he realised and said actually take me off this. The BMX XXX was basically a, a porn version of this game, or a porn version, a porn BMX game using this engine uh, where you could race as nude female uh, bikers um, and when you beat certain kind of parts of the game you unlocked videos of uh, strippers basically doing strip routines. Uh, so obviously that didn't go down too well. Uh, oddly, the GameCube version of that was uncensored, and the PS2 one was censored. Sony, were, Sony obviously thought we don't want any any part of this. Uh, we don't want nudity and PlayStation games. Whereas Nintendo, maybe because the GameCube was struggling, thought stuff it might as well <laughs> see what happens. Um, but yeah, that was, that was after this. And at this point, the series was still doing well, so this is a popular game. Um, it didn't have its own. It wasn't without its own controversy. It had. Um, a hidden character called Amish Boy, where you were like a, a, a kind of Mennonite, like an Amish a child race, racing a wooden bike. Uh, so that was a wee bit politically incorrect. Um, and also a, a weird one, like one of the hidden characters was just a normal person. Uh, Slim Jim, the kind of meat-based snack in the US, similar to Pepper Ami over here. Uh, ran a competition where if you won the competition you would be put in the game, so some guy won it. Um, so he's an unlockable character in the game, just random American person. 
So that's fun. So you can choose between him or Amish boy for your hidden character goodness. Uh, there's also a guy from the Slim Jim advert was put in it as well, but again, as a Brit, that was kind of lost on me. Um, so yeah, decent wee game. Uh, like I say, trickier than Tony Hawk, but uh, not without its charm. Um, and yeah, there we go. Uh, speaking of Tony Hawk, here's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Um, to my, For my money, uh, the best Tony Hawk game still is this one, the third one. Um, because it just it became complete at this point. The first Tony Hawk obviously was kind of revolutionary and kind of made everyone who wasn't interested in skateboarding realise that skateboarding was a thing. Um, beyond just going about on a skateboard, the, the actual kind of art of doing state skateboard tricks and stuff kind of you could you could argue that the Tony Hawk games kind of made that popular again so the first game was great um, second game added manuals it's where you land like what they're doing on the screen let me try and see no, they're not showing it there well it's a grind but the same sort of thing but on the floor uh, so the second game added manuals so which meant you could land from a jump or a grind uh, and kind of continue a balancing trick onto the next jump or grind so it meant you could basically string together combos uh, but the third one added the revert which where you landed on the ramp you could kind of spin around and keep the combos going so that made it like the, the perfect game because you could get enormous combos going at that point Tony Hawk 3 the best Tony Hawk that was too short that was a shame right Activision what have you got for us Ah, okay. So Bloody Roar uh, Primal Fury was the third Bloody Roar game. It was out on PlayStation 2 as just Bloody Roar 3, uh, but then the GameCube version was called Bloody Roar Primal Fury. Um, it's a fighting game that they started on PlayStation um, years before this, um, and you can tell it's like a kind of standard fighting game. But it's got this really bizarre twist where um, every character can transform into an animal, a beast, if you will. Um, and then obviously get new moves and some of these make sense um, a lot of them turn into wolves or tigers or lions and leopards but then some of them are really weird so someone turns into a rabbit and one of them turns into a mole as you can see there and, and like a chameleon and some kind of nondescript insects so there's some kind of weird animals that don't really wouldn't really strike fear in your heart if, you, if one turned up I think if a um, if I encountered a chameleon I'd be too concerned but apparently in Bloody Roar Primal Fury they're uh, a force to be reckoned with but yeah there you go, it is what it is it, it's, it, had, it's, it had a following um, it had a kind of cult following um, obviously it's not remembered in the same way as Alexa um, <laughs> from the creators of Bloody Roar 1 and 2 and 3 even though this is 3 um, yeah, the, 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 it's obviously not gone down in history with the likes of Street Fighter and Tekken and Mortal Kombat, etc. But uh, there you go, rabbit, rabbit combat. Uh, bloody roar, there it is. The glory days are here again. Now here's a monumental historical game, uh, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. And Sonic Adventure 2 had already come out on the Dreamcast, um, I believe at this point. Um, so this wasn't a new game, this is just a port that added some extra stuff. There's like extra chow uh, raisin things, there's kind of little creatures that you can raise, there's extra bits with those. And the textures were improved a bit and the, the, the game looked to be a bit better. Um, Sonic Adventure 2, basically the debut of Shadow the Hedgehog, uh, the most controversial character in the game, and Rouge the Bat, the kind of sultry, large-chested bat, <laughs> as you do. But the crucial thing about this was that whoever's playing this is playing the Spanish version as well, you can tell. Um, 
the the big deal about Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was it was the first time ever that Sonic the Hedgehog appeared on a Nintendo system. Um, and nowadays that doesn't seem like such a big deal because it's been, uh, what, 16 years now? Um, and there's been more Sonic games on Nintendo than you could probably count off the top of your head. But back then, you need to remember this was at a time where um, the console war had been going on throughout the entire 1990s and suddenly we're in the new millennium and all of a sudden Sonic's on Nintendo, which was unthinkable at the time because in the 90s growing up, if you were a kid growing up, it was you were Sega or Nintendo. I mean, I was both, but most people were Sega or Nintendo. You were Mario or you were Sonic. Um, you, you couldn't, you, if you bought a Mega Drive or Genesis, if you're American, you had to live with the fact that you weren't getting so you weren't getting Mario. Sonic was your your thing, and if you had a Super Nintendo or an NES um, or an N sixty four, then the opposite was true. You were very much a, a Mario man or woman, um, and you hated Sonic. Oh, Sonic's just a wee a fool with an attitude. Um, so the the kind of two never crossed. But then Sega started having financial difficulties. Um, they kind of messed up with the, the Mega CD was a kind of a nothing they didn't do too well, the 32X did even worse um, Sega Saturn was a distant third uh, versus N64 and Playstation um, and then when they tried a game with the Dreamcast which was excellent um, it just didn't sell like the PS2, GameCube and Xbox were when you've got a four horse race um, and you're the fourth horse because you, partly because it launched quite early um, Sega at that point decided well, we're not going to try again with another system that might fail again we're just going to become a developer from now on and a publisher and that's what happened, the Dreamcast became Sega's last system and Sega said right time to make games for other systems including our old enemies Nintendo and Sonic Adventure 2 had only just come out in the Dreamcast a wee while ago so they thought fine let's make it on the Gamecube so more people can play it so there we go a historical first ever time uh, Sonic was on a, a Nintendo system. Right, Spy Hunter was a reboot um, of the old arcade game from the 80s, Spy Hunter, where you were a wee car, like you were basically a secret agent, you were a kind of fake James Bond, uh, riding your car about. Um, and Spy Hunter was quite a difficult game where you used to kind of uh, navigate your way through enemies and stuff but your car could then turn into a boat which was the gimmick um, and yeah so that kind of was the case with this reboot where again your um, your car could transform into a boat that was the, the, the thing um, and fire weapons as well I believe yes um, yeah there we go yeah firing guns um I quite like this. This is my guilty pleasure back in the day. Um, as was the music. <laughs> they got Saliva, who were like a kind of new metal, kind of alt rock band from the 2000s, uh, early 2000s, to do a theme tune for it. So this is, they did a exclusive Spy Hunter theme, and that's what this is. Um, there was always going to be. There was meant to be a Spy Hunter movie starring The Rock, um, and that. Was just in kind of production hell for ages to this day it's still never really been properly greenlit and we still don't really know what's happening it would be a cool film because it would basically be a fake James Bond but with more explosions and with The Rock as fake Bond uh, which sounds good to me but um, yeah I enjoyed this it was a kind of it was a daft uh, kind of action racing game where you were racing but also as you can see blowing the hell out of things uh, as you do Yeah, the music is the most um, early 2000s music. You can imagine it would fit perfectly in a Attitude Era WWE promo video or, or something of that ilk. Um, it's that very clear. You listen to that music and you know exactly with, within five years what year it was released <laughs> because nobody does music like this anymore. Um, but yeah, there you go. It's just that. That just that odd era where all that kind of music started sounding the same. There's not really a lot more to say about Spy Hunter, which is awkward because this is a longer, a much longer trailer than uh, Sonic and Tony Hawk got. Uh, so that's a shame. 
Uh, but I enjoyed it. Uh, it was by no means one of the best games ever made. Um, but it was daft and it was the video game equivalent of a popcorn flick. There was no... Uh, you were, Nobody nowadays will look back and say, oh, remember Spy Hunter? What a... Uh, what a profound game that had such a lasting impact on me. It wasn't, it was daft and you could blow things up and drive really fast, so... Um, yeah, kind of beat it. Ah, uh, now then. This is everyone's kind of... For most people, at least, this was the launch game for the GameCube. Because the GameCube didn't launch with a proper Mario game, and it obviously launched with Luigi's Mansion, but uh, you would have a lot. You would have had a lot of people saying at the time that was more of a, a, a kind of shorter kind of tech demo of what the GameCube was capable of. Uh, so Luigi's Mansion obviously did really well, and people bought it, but it wasn't considered in the same way that you would have considered Super Mario World or Super Mario Brothers or Super Mario sixty four. It wasn't in that ilk. It was just kind of. It was more kind of quirky game um, so for gamers who wanted like something they could properly sink their teeth into Rogue Leader, Star Wars Rogue Leader Rogue Squadron uh, Squadron 2 the like, most annoyingly long name it was the game because um, it compared to all the other GameCube stuff the other GameCube stuff looked good but this looked astronomical uh, compared to everything else and it still does look great you watch the video here I mean it's trickier because it's obviously coming from a VHS but if you dig out a GameCube or a Wii um, and put this in it uh, it looks incredible still to this day despite being in standard def um, I would kill for an HD remake of that um, it's a shame but it's yeah it's it was the game it was the launch game and, and rightly so Oh, there's the old Spider-Man. Um, this was based on the first Spider-Man movie, so there was um, Treyarch did this. They the same team that worked on the uh, helped with the Tony Hawk games. Um, this one's more kind of linear. The, 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 the more famous Spider-Man game from this era was Spider-Man Two, uh, obviously based on the second movie. This is the first one. Uh, this is more linear. Um, it's got more linear based levels and it's still good, there's still kind of good combat and web swing and stuff and all that but it's, most of that is kind of automatic. It wasn't until the second game where it basically had free roaming bits where you could explore the city at your own kind of pace. Uh, but yeah, still a, still a fun game, just not. Spider-Man 2 is the one everyone remembers. Spider-Man 1 was, was good. Uh, Konami, what happened? Um, here's ISS two. Uh, this, this is a weird part that I could go on and on about the history of ISS, but um, in fact I might because this is a very long section, uh, needlessly long. But but obviously I say needlessly because this is a UK video. Um, obviously whoever at game put this together uh, realised that the Brits are into their football, so they'd be curious to see more of uh, the other football game that was coming to. Uh, to the GameCube. Um, ISS is International Superstar, Sto International Superstar Soccer, it's easy for me to say. Um, it originally launched, the first ISS launched on the Super Nintendo. Uh, there was actually a, an NES game before that, but that wasn't really part of it, Hyper Soccer. Um, but the first proper one was International Superstar Soccer on the SNES, uh, which then had a kind of semi-sequel, ISS Deluxe. Um, and then at that point, uh, Konami kind of split it into two teams. So there's a team that went to work on PlayStation games um, and a team that went to work on, at the time, Nintendo 64 games. So uh, PlayStation got ISS Pro, uh, which eventually became Pro Evolution Soccer and is kind of existing still to this day. Whereas Nintendo 64 got ISS 64, ISS 98, ISS 2000, and they, were, they went in a different direction and were developed by a studio called Major A. Um, so this ISS2 is based on ISS64, it's the kind of sequel to ISS64 um, and it's kind of N64 sequels, um, which is why it looks different to the, pro it kind of looks a bit weirder than Pro Evil uh, does, 
Um, the animations are a bit... The whole thing just looks a bit more rigid. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't look quite as smooth. Uh, and is slightly less realistic. The, the Pro Evolution Soccer... Well, ISS Pro at the time, but then Pro Evolution Soccer games um, widely agreed to be more fun to play. But I, I like this one because it felt like more arcadey. Um, ISS 3, I believe. I don't know if it was 2. I think it was 3. Had this really weird... Um, feature where when you went to take some corners or uh, do some dribbles you, you could the game slowed right down and showed you a close up of the ball and you could choose where to kick the ball uh, whereabouts in the ball to make contact to kind of to move to, to kick the ball and, and kind of plan your next moves that was a really weird idea because it kind of turned matrix sized the, the, the kind of matrix type thing where everything slowed down really abruptly and it was really, really unlike a football game um, but yeah I, I, kind of die hard Nintendo fans who loved ISS 64 and 98 and 2000 would be more comfortable with this because this is the kind of next natural evolution uh, pun always intended of of the N64 games but at this point people were realising there was better things on other systems and so it kind of felt a bit it was starting to show its age at that point, basically the engine. Um, so yeah, after ISS3 there wasn't really any more after that. This is Driven, based on the Sylvester Stallone movie of the same name that everyone obviously remembers. Um, yeah, <laughs> obviously, uh, this is a gamble gone wrong. Uh, obviously it was decided that Driven was going to be an enormous movie. The Rocky of the uh, motor racing world um, and so it would make sense to make a, a video game based on Driven starring all the characters from the movie that everyone knows and loves um, and obviously it turned out Driven was an absolute bomb that no one saw um, and therefore the game uh, came and went without a trace. I remember very little about Driven um, and looking at it it's pretty clear why. Uh, quite bland uh, looking environments uh, bland looking cars. Apparently Stallone wanted to make it about F1 but um, he went to some F1 races and everyone was so secretive about it uh, that he couldn't get actually get any information about how F1 worked so he made it about a kind of lesser uh, American uh, type of motorsports. I can't remember what it was exactly but it's based on that instead. Grand Cars or something it's called. Um, so yeah that's, that's driven. It's, it's your life will your life will not have suffered if you never played Driven. Um, you can live to be a hundred and never play it and um, as you lie in your deathbed uh, you can still consider your life complete. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was harsh but I'm just trying to kill time. Uh, well this needlessly long demo of a bad racing game uh, continues to trundle on. I mean, to be fair, for its time it didn't look terrible, it's just looking at it now, the, the, it's very, very bland uh, scenery. No, we're not done yet. Look at the steering wheel though, it's just one one shade. Oh, <laughs> there we go, it was abrupt. Right, if it's racing you're looking for, folks. Uh, this is Extreme G3. There were two Extreme G games on N64 um, and then two on GameCube um, and also PlayStation 2 and stuff like that. Um, the, the, this was their, it, was, it was basically F0 on motorbikes. Um, extremely fast games. Uh, 50 frames a second in the UK, 60 in the US. Um, ran like butter. Uh, by which I mean it was smooth, not that it melted um, in the heat. And it was, I enjoyed it. It, it. it didn't, it wasn't as popular as F-Zero obviously. Um, and it did have some kind of, uh, it did have its problems. There were some kind of cheap sections where it was kind of frustrating at times. Uh, which is what you kind of get when you're dealing with a game this fast. A lot of the handling was maybe a bit too twitchy. Um, but you can tell by looking at it, this video is maybe not the best example of it. Um, because I'm not sure it's been captured uh, with 50 frames in mind. 
Uh, obviously in the UK we had 50 frames a second and as opposed to 60 it was only until we uh, TV stopped, moved from CRTs to kind of more modern TVs that we started getting 60 frames a second as well. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it, 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 the aim was very much speed, so big wide tracks um, to prevent frustration, but there were still times where you'd be like, oh for God's sake, <laughs> what do you expect when you're driving a, a bike at 400 miles an hour? Um, but there you go. It's a cool game, it gave a really good sensation of speed. Um, even though, oh yeah, that's right, it had guns as well, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, even though, obviously, compared to F Zero, it wasn't um, it wasn't the best futuristic racing game out there. But for GameCube fans that were early adopters, it was it would do for 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 a while, um, especially because Sony were enjoying like Wipeout and stuff like that at the time. N sixty four, N sixty four. GameCube fans still wanted their, their kind of taste of futuristic racing, so this kind of filled that void until F-Zero GX eventually came. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a fun game, I enjoyed it. I got my, my money's worth out of it, um, as I did with the, the previous two games. Never played a fourth, uh, but I understand it's more of the same. Um, but yeah. Quite a technical feat to get, because it's not like it's the most basic looking game. It's not, it's not massively detailed, but it's not just uh, simple shapes and so to get something running that speed uh, at such a smooth frame rate um, was a real kind of feat uh, so fair play to acclaim uh, continuing the driving theme the legendary burnout or burnout as it's known in Scotland um, Burnout, for those who don't remember it, uh, oh, it's a really bad quality <laughs> capture here. Um, it's a racing game uh, by EA and Criterion, and, and it was a racing game where finishing first was obviously the, the aim, but if you just r drove kind of straight and, and kind of raced normally, chances are you weren't going to make it, you weren't going to win, because the main point of burnout is build, building up your burnout meter uh, which is a bar at the bottom of the screen and you did that by driving dangerously so uh, driving on the wrong side of the road uh, driving really close to cars um, like near misses and stuff like that doing drifts uh, this all filled up your meter um, and once the meter reached the top um, you could pull off like a, a ridiculous turbo boost thing um, so that was one of the kind of main selling points of burnout. The other selling point was the crashes uh, which these days are quite basic looking but back then um, it was a big deal to have like kind of slow-mo uh, slow-mo was the big thing at the time because of the matrix and stuff um, you, you, anytime you hit something at high speed the, the, you would get a really gratuitous slow motion replay ever from going and crumpling up and stuff like that and the satisfaction was in especially in later burnout games like burnout uh, takedown but it was uh, pushing opponents into other cars and then watching slow motion of them crashing uh, it was always uh, massively satisfying so this is the first game that, I mean uh, most people kind of agree that the later burnout games were better obviously but you had to kind of uh, lay down the, the standards with, with, with something and that was that was with this one um, a brilliant game. Oh, here's a burnout kicking in. Full speed. But yeah, really. Um, oh, there's one of the crashes. Yeah, this was what kind of arcade style racing was all about. But everyone absolutely loved the burnout games. Um, it'd be excellent to have a new one again. They, 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 they went in a slightly different direction later on. With Burnout Paradise, which is kind of more open worldy and kind of online, um, it would be lovely to see um, an older Burnout, like like a, a new version of, of one of these Burnouts, which is just a street racing game with crashing in it. But I, to be honest, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, I'd imagine if there's ever another Burnout, it will be open world again, given how uh, the gaming world is now. 
uh, online inclined. That's 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 life. And finally, we have um, cell damage, which was published by EA. This was a uh, cell shading was still kind of a thing back then. Um, not a lot of games do it these days, but after Jet Set Radio came out, or Jet Grind Radio, if you're that way inclined, um, on the Dreamcast, suddenly everyone went, oh, that's a good idea, let's uh, polygonal games where you don't colour color in the polygon, you don't basically create textures, the difference is just flat colours. Um, so a load of kind of cell shaded games started coming out, and cell damage was one of them. It's a, as you can tell by looking at it, it's a vehicle combat game, kind of like Twisted Metal um, on the PlayStation. But different in that there's no kind of power battle. Like you could kill people really easily, um, and they could regenerate quite quickly. Because the, the the idea is that they're all characters from a cartoon series, uh, kind of like Wacky Races, but with violence. Um, and yeah, so you choose one of the characters um, and have to take out the rest while in your car. It's fun. It's a good. It's a good wee game. Uh, there were there were HD versions. Um, on PS3, PS4, Vita, I believe, and Xbox One. It's called, it's called Cell Damage HD. So it's a good, it's a good game. You can you can find it nowadays if you if you fancy, if you like the look of it. Um, yeah, it was it was a lot of people a lot of people have fond memories of this, even though it's a game that's mostly forgotten for the most part. A lot of people, I think there was a lengthy period where shops were selling it quite cheaply. Um, so I think a lot of people ended up with it. Uh, and so as a result it's got a kind of a lot of people fondly remember it and it was a fun game to be fair um, yeah it looked it looked cool for the time even though cell shading had been done at, at this point it was still being celebrated enough that it, it didn't get to the, there was a point later on where people said okay enough of the cell shading now it's, it's getting it's getting boring but at this point it was still it was still cool still considered very cool so there we go, that's all the games, um, and then the video ends with a little promo showing you some of the accessories you can buy from game and electronics boutique, including some hideous looking <laughs> third party controllers, all filmed in somebody's living room by the looks of it. There's a classic controller. That A button is still one of the best buttons in gaming history. Accompanied by the yellow C stick, one of the worst analog sticks in gaming history. I always hated the C stick. Memory card was never big enough, especially because the C stick. Everyone's C stick ended up getting all grimy and kind of black and mucky looking. She's put that in the wrong slot. Um, the the you know what I mean because it's made of that weird kind of rubber. There's an underused this peripheral. Allows you to connect your game Boy the link cable for the, to the game, game Boy Advance. For use as an additional game screen or controller. Pac-Man Versus used that really well. From game Was it Pac-Man Versus? Yeah. Look at controller. that. This controller from GameStar has a comfortable design with smooth grips and gives the game a responsive control. It's horrendous. The Pro Racer. So does that. Is it a steering wheel or controller? So similar to the controller Namco made, was it the Negcon, where you kind of twisted the the PlayStation racing controller made for for Ridge Racer, um, where you could twist it like that to steer, as if anyone that, that doesn't make it a steer. No steering wheel works like that, and you can tell she's struggling with it. No steering wheel, like kind of, you, you don't twist a steering wheel like that. Just put it in the wrong slot again. Come on, mate. From four gamers. <laughs> Flight stick. This is back in the glory. I mean, you still get third party controllers these days, but nowhere near uh, to the extent as you used to get back then. Like, the, 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 any time a new system is coming out, uh, it seems that third parties just did free reign to make any old trash. Uh, whereas nowadays, at least, it seems most companies now kind of license the the right to make controllers, which is which is good. Adapters. That screen was always a cool idea. Also includes headphone sockets. Because the GameCube was so small, it made SD sense to make a kind of screen that attached it. Consoles and DVD players. 
Licensed GameCube Backpack. Nintendo's licensed GameCube Backpack. Yeah, many people shoulder straps carried their GameCube to their pal's house for games of Smash Brothers when, when Smash Brothers finally came out. The internal zipped pockets and front zipped pockets are also what a lovely living room. Games. These are just a few of the products available at your local. Like the couch, much though. Pre-order yours today. There we go. So, as you can see, stock shortage expected. So, if you haven't pre-ordered your GameCube yet, get on it uh, because you're going to miss out. Um, I know I certainly did. And there we go. Game and EB. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that video. Plenty more to come. Check out TitleHack.com for other VHS tapes. And I'll catch you later. Thanks. Bye bye.